everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm John Paul Parmigiani, CEO and co-founder of Impact Hub New York Metropolitan Area. Uh, we are a nonprofit supporting entrepreneurs and change makers through programs designed to help impactful ideas take off. We work across the New York Metropolitan Area uh, with focus areas in Manhattan, Queens, Newark, and Morristown, New Jersey. Uh, Impact Hub is a global association of more than 100 Impact Hubs around the world in 100 cities and over 50 countries. Uh, Impact State of Mind is a virtual series created to support uh, innovators during the COVID-19 crisis. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. We are really uh, honored to have uh, online with us uh, Rebecca May, who is the Innovation Director at NYC Emergency Management Department. Uh, we obviously, we know this is a very challenging time uh, for the city for multiple reasons. So thank you so much for joining us, Rebecca. Uh, it is a, a true honor to have you and a privilege uh, on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here and I'm really uh, glad to be speaking to your entrepreneurs. Awesome. So I was wondering if you could just start and maybe tell us a little bit about uh, the upcoming challenges this summer. Of um, so looking at the summer, some of the challenges, uh, we're going to be adapting our existing emergency plans to deal with, um, to incorporate the COVID response into those plans. So for example, uh, we have heat emergencies in the city in the summer um, when the heat index goes above 95 degrees. And normally we would direct people to cooling centers, which is a congregate place where they can go inside and sit in the air conditioning and get cool during daytime hours. Um, this summer, we wanted to take into account that a lot of the population might not be able to do that. So um, especially those at high risk to COVID. Um, so we're promoting um, in-home air AC usage if you have to stay at home um, to decrease your risk to COVID. And for that, we created a program um, through existing city agencies. And some of the data that we were looking at um, was the most vulnerable New Yorkers um, to distribute those ACs to. So a lot of them came from existing city families um, and individuals who are involved in existing city programs. Uh, some of the criteria are 60% or lower or less of the state median income. Um, age 60 or over, um, and those that don't have an existing AC at home. One of the other challenges with that data was that as we continue to look into that and drill down into the data and looking at the actual deaths that occurred due to heat in the past, um, we found out there were other factors that were even greater um, an impact than age. So um, the traditional age cap was age 65 and over, but looking at the data, um, different groups of people were dying at even younger ages than 65 due to impacts of heat. So what they did to try to equalize or make it slightly more equitable is lower the age range to qualify for those programs. If you have a qualifying health condition that is negatively impacted by heat uh, and you get a doctor's notice for that, you can qualify for a state program which will um, help you choose and install an AC through one of the state vendors, and that's through the uh, New York State HEAP program, H-E-A-P. The economics have changed uh, throughout the city in terms of what kinds of businesses can operate as they had been previously. Uh, businesses have to you know, look at finding ways to maintain uh, safety standards that are now different than before so that people aren't spreading COVID um, and uh, what kind of steps uh, is the city and uh, taking and, and looking for maybe businesses to think about as they're innovating new models. Sure, thank you for that. Um, so for our, as we incorporate these social distancing measures into our emergency responses, we have a few different adaptations that we've created. So one of them um, is for, um, is limiting the congregate transportation that we would normally do um, when we have a large vacate order. So if we have a lot of individuals that are displaced from their home and we're vacating them to um, an American Red Cross hotel, we would normally do that on an MTA bus and have everyone just on the bus together um, because that is, we, that would cause congregation. We're looking at either 
um, additional buses where we could distance people inside the bus, um, or we also have transportation contracts that we put into place to allow um, families to take individual cars to transport them um, to the their vacate hotel. Um, some of the other challenges in general include social distancing measures and safety measures. So um, if we do open cooling centers, we would in, um, in the summer, we would have to allow for additional space for people. Also, we would have to make sure people coming in have a face mask or provide them with one. Um, and that same challenge is going to just um, be replicated in every emergency response. So for example, shelter scenarios, in, if we have a coastal storm, we're going to have to take that into consideration in sheltering scenarios as well. And that's, uh, there's definitely some room for some innovation there uh, as far as social distancing measures um, during, during sheltering operations. Got it. So it sounds like the, the city is looking a lot at the summer uh, and the, the heat of the summer as a real challenge. Um, obviously, as uh, people, you know, need to uh, maintain cool because there are issues that people have health-wise that come up. Are there any geographies in particular within the city um, or any groups that, you know, need to be paid a particular attention to? So we do have um, heat index values or high vulnerability areas to heat and that map is put together by the Department of Health um, and Mental Hygiene. And we consider HVI index areas four or five, the highest impacted by heat. Um, and there are certain neighborhoods that fall into those, into those areas. Um, and there are also some, some things we can do to mitigate the impact in those areas as a city. So access to outdoor space. A lot of times it can be um, up to 20 degrees hotter inside an apartment without an air conditioner than outside. So um, ensuring that they have access to space outside the home. Um, and um, as well as different programming, um, shady spots, sprinklers. Um, the, the city actually is one of the innovations that came out of this summer um, was uh, the existing spray cap program um, is put on by FDNY and our um, and DEP. If you're interested, the, it, the reason that this innovation was created is that New York City traditionally um, opens fire hydrants in neighborhoods to cool off of during the summer. Um, but when you open a fire hydrant, it can produce, um, I mean, a ton, it causes a decrease in the water pressure. Um, because of how much water is coming out of the hydrant. So they um, created a spray cap program where they distribute spray caps and you can install them on a hydrant and then it um, creates a sprinkler system so that it um, displaces less water and it doesn't decrease the um, pressure in the water system. And the reason that decreasing the pressure in the water system is bad is when you go to fight a fire, you, there's no pressure for the fire hose. Um, which causes other problems. So anyone can actually pick up a spray cap if you want to install one in your local neighborhood from your local fire station. What other issues have come up? We've had a lot of one-off challenges that we've dealt with and during this emergency response, um, many. Um, so one of, one of them was distributing food to New Yorkers, which you can pick up at your Department of Education sites throughout the city. One was um, housing um, essential employees that live in or that work in healthcare facilities, which um, can be now um, receive a hotel room if if they needed. Um, another one was providing a safe place to stay if for people who um, were COVID positive who were discharged from a hospital but didn't have a safe place um, to stay at home. Um, Another was just increasing the city's capacity in hospital beds uh, in a very short amount of time um, when it looked like the curve was going to um, outnumber the number of hospital beds available. And um, that, I mean, I'm sure you probably saw that in action where we had the USNS Comfort come in, um, we built some field hospitals, um, so those are all, all things that have happened in the last couple of months that are extremely large operations uh, that people have been working on as this situation evolves. 
And how did how did that um, how did the services uh, get mobilized so quickly? Well, so some of the resources are mobilized through the federal and or state governments. Um, so that was like the USNS Comfort. Um, some of the resources, the local resources that the city built, um, those were done um, through contractors. So um, procuring different contracts for those constructions, working with some firms that we had existing contracts with, and then um, creating a, a new emergency procurement for, for certain um, aspects. Got it. Uh, and what would you say to innovators who are uh, you know, who have, have businesses of various kinds and are looking to pivot their model, um, you know, coming uh, up with ideas of how they can be profitable in the summer and make an impact at the same time for their businesses? So I think considering the scenario is important. So what does this scenario offer or cause that was not previously there? So for example, normally people are outside of their home in the summer and this summer they're going to be inside their home. So what is an easy way for them to be comfortable at home? What is going to um, provide cooling to them at home at a low cost and easy access? Um, if they're going outside, how are they going to be able to do that safely and comfortably? Um, and what's it going to look like in the future as things gradually go from this um, restricted environment to a less restricted environment? Got it. Um, and then as far as um, looking at um, resources that are available for the entrepreneurs to learn more, um, specifically, you know, within the department to, you know, keep track of, um, you know, what opportunities there might be to specifically work with or partner um, with the department, where do they go for that? Sure. So the, um, you're welcome to go to our website to learn more. Um, and the city in general has uh, pretty, an, a pretty, very strict, I would say, procurement process where um, all of the information has to be public to any potential vendor that could bid on it. Um, so a city agency can't tell one specific vendor what they're looking for or what they need. Uh, they have to make a proposal public. And then all of the Q and A's that come in are then distributed publicly also so that any vendor can see those responses. Um, my vendor can do a demo for the city, but they can't ask the city about what exactly they're looking for or what their current use cases are. Um, but they can tell them about what their product does and could do for the city. Um, the city also has a, a portal where vendors and potential vendors can register and they can register under different codes for the different services they can provide. And then when an agent, city agency such as um, mine goes to look for vendors or submit, um, when we put out an, a bid or an RFP, we'll select the corresponding categories and those vendors will receive a notification or we'll see that they can bid on that RFP. Uh, so we have a question that has come in. So what should businesses consider in regards to emergency preparedness during COVID? Okay. So as far as protecting um, staff and employees, um, for, but this is this is my personal opinion. This is close to uh, this is like something that I care about. Um, I would say uh, protecting employees is of the utmost importance. I think that's how you show that you care as a business. Uh, you and your staff are your most valuable assets. Um, Provide, making sure that you're providing safety measures for them. If the ability to work remotely um, the, and have um, backups in place in case that fails, the ability to um, provide them personal protective equipment if they do have to come into the office, the considerations for their commute into and out of the office. Um, if they don't have a personal vehicle, or if they can't walk to the office, if they are taking public transit, um, that, their, that their risk might be increased um, due to that. And then if you are in the office, making sure you're, being, you're socially distancing in the office, that people are wearing face coverings, um, that things are sanitized regularly, and that all of those um, hand sanitizer, um, hand washing stations, et cetera, are provided to, to your clients. 
what can this whole um, instance of, of dealing with the COVID-19 uh, crisis tell us about the city's preparedness and how we need to maybe continue to um, make sure that as future crises happen, um, that we're also you know, more prepared, drawing lessons from uh, what happened uh, this year? So yeah, I think this is this has been a really big lesson in preparedness for a lot of uh, different institutions. Um, so as far as business continuity goes, I think in in general, like the the basic principles still apply, but I think that they have been underscored even more, um, as well as some additional things like personal protective equipment that a lot of um, places didn't have on hand that I think they will now um, they will now keep on hand. Uh, also, this, this might not be the end of this emergency. You know, we could see spikes uh, throughout the summer or in the fall. Um, and so I would, you know, urge people not to get complacent. Um, and, uh, and in general, I think uh, the technology and focusing on technology and the ability, the ability to work remotely is something that um, I think We've all, we all had to learn very, I mean, a lot of places had to learn very quickly who didn't previously do remote work. And I think one of the best practices is to keep it up and make sure that people are comfortable using that type of technology at home and regularly kind of practicing that um, and figuring out if there are things that you felt like you weren't able to do remotely during this response, how can you, how can you remedy that in the future? Good. And then what are the, what's the uh, framework for preparedness in the first place? Like what are the general factors um, that the city looks at? So that's a big question. We have 27 emergency plans, depending on the event. So it, it's pretty event specific. Um, I think some of the, the general things that we look at for any emergency response are life safety, first and foremost. Um, minimizing risk um, to property, um, looking at economic impacts. And, um, and those are the t three of the top priorities. Got it. So we have another question that's come in. So outside of the hand sanitizer and gloves, uh, do you have any further recommendations for the type of PPE that should be on hand in case of an emergency? Um, so it's a, it's a, there, there are a lot of different debates on this. Um, so, I mean, I would recommend checking with experts, public health experts like the CDC for this. Um, I know some, some offices will keep dust masks um, on hand because if there's like something like an explosion nearby, then it helps to, um, if you're evacuating the building, to not breathe in that kind of debris. Um, it just it really it depends on the scenario and what you want to plan for. Um, in this and some, some will keep N95 masks on hand. A word on N95 masks is that they have to be fit tested or they're not, um, they don't do what they were intended to do. And that, that's a very um, specific, it, it's um, even a small change can, can make them ineffective. So for example, if it's, it's fitting on someone's face and they have facial hair, um, it's no longer, fitting. Um, so that's just something as far as masks go and what you think you might be. Um, false, a false sense of comfort, basically. Um, and also, the, right now, they're, they're definitely needed for um, the medical field. Got it. But there are different, different kinds of um, facial coverings and masks available. So I, I know a lot of people are, are wondering how long we're gonna be dealing with COVID-19 and no one really knows, obviously, whether this is going to be something that starts to get, to get measurably better and something that comes back or something that uh, is just going to be around almost indefinitely for a number of years. Um, I'm just curious, you know, from the, the city's perspective, um, you know, what, what's the most likely scenario or what, what are some of the scenarios that you guys are looking at in terms of how long it, it will last that we'll have to deal with it? Um, if you can start. I don't know if you want to know the answer to that. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, I mean, for, I mean, for forward planning, for, 
Yeah, for, for forward planning, for worst case scenario, the, what we were using as a planning assumption uh, as of like a month ago was what happens if there's some form of this um, through, through the end of the year until there's a vaccine available. Um, so that's one of the many planning assumptions that are out there. It just depends on who you're planning with and for, and um, it's definitely not not concrete. And that's just one that my group happened to be using. Got it. Um, and then in terms of uh, specific populations within the city uh, that might need more support during the uh, this, this the crisis. So one of the other. Um, Categories that came out when um, DOHMH did some additional research onto the deaths that occurred due, um, due to heat in previous summers was that certain populations, um, one being African Americans, ended up um, die, um, having more heat related mortality than other populations and at a younger age. So that's um, part of why the age was decreased to 60 instead of 65 because those deaths were occurring at say maybe like 54 or 59 or 62, 64 before you got to 65. Um, and, and there are definitely, um, and if you look at those high heat vulnerability populations, they're almost um, directly overlaid with the population that are at high risk to COVID. Um, so that's, it's, um, pretty significant as far as the, that specific, um, those specific populations are negatively impacted by both of those factors. Got it. And where was New York City uh, least prepared um, for COVID-19? Um, or- Fair question. <laughs> I'm, sorry, I'm sorry to grill you because we're trying to you know, figure these things out. Um, uh, or maybe put another way, you know, maybe also where where the most prepared, like what a key success was. So I, I feel like our team was in general well trained um, to respond to any emergency. And so I think one of the challenges with, with something like this is that um, it's new, it's novel, and it's constantly evolving. We're getting new information in every week. So you're trying to make decisions based on the information at that time. Um, I have my own opinions about uh, where we <laughs> were at least prepared. Um, I definitely think, I mean, you hear a lot um, in general about um, testing procedures um, as, you know, as a nation, we, that was pretty slow on the uptake. Um, we in New York State did um, allow um, private companies to make their own tests and I think that was a huge um, win for New York State, and I, I think that's one of the things that um, al allowed us to be able to really see the impacts of the of the pandemic, um, and the responsiveness of the of the team and the employees of New York City was really incredible. People really um, really gave it their all when they were responding. And we were able to ramp up several very large initiatives like building additional hospitals, um, creating a huge food distribution program um, in you know, a matter of days and weeks. Uh, one, of, well, one of the points I realized I didn't quite uh, finish previously was adapted spray caps. So the spray cap program that we have traditionally um, we wanted to modify that so that the spray would go even further so that people could social distance while they were playing in the water spray. And so those will be deployed. Um, um, our Department of Parks has worked um, on adapting the spray caps for the summer. And um, the traditional spray caps will be deployed as well as the ones with that increase the spray. So that social distancing is really like a, a theme that's going on here. And another innovative program that I would recommend the entrepreneurs check out is the Cool Roofs program. I, it's a great program. It's painting the roof um, reflective or white and it decreases the cooling, uh, the cooling costs in home. It decreases the temperature on the roof and decreases the temperature um, in the um, buildings. Um, the studies that 
um, we're done on that. We're done on single family homes or single um, story homes. So we don't have the data for like multi um, for high rises, but uh, definitely, that's a great program with a lot of different areas of innovation. It does job training, it does um, outreach to high risk populations, and it um, enables people to get do job placement afterwards. It also, it provides a great benefit for the city. And if you do a cluster of buildings together, it actually decreases the heat island effect. Awesome. Great. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, happy Friday to everyone. I hope everyone has a great weekend, um, you know, obviously uh, during these challenging times. Uh, we want to say Black Lives Matter and uh, make sure that people know that we stand uh, with uh, people who are peacefully protesting. Um, so with that, everyone have a great weekend uh, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing you in upcoming sessions. And thank you, Rebecca. Thank you so much.